There is nothing in all Italy like Caparola. So wrote Edith Wharton in her 1904 book, Italian Villas in Their Gardens, the substance of which arose from a series of articles she wrote for Century Magazine that were in turn prompted by her successful first novel, The Valley of Decision. The Valley of Decision takes place in 18th century Italy, and she knew Italy very well, having lived there as a child and returning many times with her husband. This novel and the articles for Century Magazine contributed to the creation of her very successful travel book, Italian Villas and Their Gardens. It is pertinent now to repeat Edith Wharton's writing in Italian Villas, where she says that gardens are a prolongation of the house, so that they are really considered one unit. And also, a forerunner of hers, Charles Platt, wrote in his 1894 publication, Italian Gardens, the word villa is used in the Italian sense, implying that all the former parts of the grounds arranged in direct relation to the house, the house itself being as much a part of it as the garden or the grove. And as she wrote, the old Italian garden was meant to be lived in, and that the travel of returning from Italy was full of the ineffable garden magic. She was pleased to do these articles, some of which were accompanied by illustrations drawn by well-known artist Maxfield Parrish. She felt that the subject of Italian gardens had not been properly addressed before, and she wanted to present an accurate and informative series on the subject. In January of 1903, she and her husband, Teddy, arrived in Genoa from Boston and started their countrywide quest for villas and gardens, some well-known and others more obscure, eventually visiting over 75 villas. One villa she was hoping to see was Villa Farnese in Caparola, located about 30 miles northwest of Rome, which at that time was difficult to gain admittance to. However, with the aid of her Boston friend, George Van Lenke Meyer, who happened to be the United States ambassador to Rome, she was allowed to visit. Meyer had an automobile or motor, as she called them, and suggested he could drive them to Caparola, and she recounts in her autobiography, A Back of Glance, that this was her first ride in such a vehicle. We did the run in about an hour, and I was able to see the villa and gardens fairly well before we tore back to Rome, she wrote. She was thrilled with the experience and later said, that she felt that the automobile had brought back the romance of travel. I think it is the most beautiful excursion I ever made in Italy, she wrote to her friend Daisy Chandler in March of 1903. I did the trip last year, in November, in about the same time. Of course, she had a lot less traffic, mainly horses and carriages. Villa Farnese, considered one of the finest examples of Renaissance architecture, is a massive 16th century villa construction of which began in the 1520s when the property was purchased by Cardinal Alessandro Farnese, later Pope Paul III. Pope Paul III is remembered for creation of the Council of Trent and his anti-Reformation statue. Originally built as a rocco, or fortress, and designed by Sangallo the Younger, it remained as such a structure until it became the property of Farnese's grandson of the same name, who in 1556 commissioned Giacomo Parozzi di Bagnola to design the villa in the Mannerist style with the same footprint at the fortress, and in a pentagonal shape with a circular courtyard, a very unusual design. Bagnola had worked under Michelangelo on a number of projects, including Villa del Papa Giulio in Rome. Mannerism, which followed high Renaissance and preceded Baroque, displayed in architecture similar themes to Mannerism in art, and that includes complex novel and unexpected designs. The villa overlooks the town of Caparola, a medieval village with a street bisecting the town. As a result of the construction of the villa, it is said that while Vignola was designing and building the palace, he learned of a planned visit there by Pope Gregory XIII and the desire to honor the pontiff who had implemented Paul III's Council of Trent recommendations and also created the Gregorian calendar. Pignola ordered that a new roadway be built by removing the existing dwellings and providing the visitor an unimpeded view of the imposing edifice. The villa, which is surrounded by a moat, is comprised of five floors or levels, the lowest being for arriving guests in the carriages and also the kitchen and services. The next level is the main entrance level and is used for illustrious guests 
and includes the Room of Jupiter and a room for the guards. The next floor up is the Piano Nobile, the first floor and a reserve for the Cardinal. And the top two floors are reserved for the court gentlemen and for their servants. Connecting the main level with the Piano Nobile is the famous Scalia Regia, or Regal Staircase, designed by Vignola, and it is so wide that it could accommodate visitors astride their horses, although there's no evidence that ever happened. The frescoes adorning the walls and the vaulted ceiling were designed by Antonio Tempesta in the Mannerist style, with a feeling of fantasy on display. The Piano Nobile contains both the summer and winter apartments, consisting of five rooms each. The summer apartments loggia served as the dining room and overlooks the town. The room is called the Room of Hercules, with the decorated with frescoes by Marta Corone and later Jacopo Bertoia, and for the fountain designed by Corzio Macarone. Also on this floor is the chapel, and then the room of Farnese Deeds, portraying their notable family accomplishments, including the creation of the Council of Trent, convoked in 1545 by Pope Paul III. Also is the marvelous Sala di Mappamondo, or map room, painted by Giovanni de Vecchi, showing the five continents then known, and on the vaulted ceiling above representation of the constellations and celestial objects. It's interesting to note how much was known of the world in the middle of the 16th century. The views on the maps are projected in a God's eye view, like a celestial globe, as if looking at the earth from outer space. The gardens are accessed from this level over three drawbridges spanning the encircling moat and lead to two parterre gardens, each reflecting the sides of the villa which are the two top sides of the Pentagon design. These gardens, which Edith described as a mere wreck of overgrown box parterres and crumbling wall and balustrades, is now presented as clear parts and restored garden sculptures. And it is apparent where the flower beds are. However, since I was there in late November, there were few to be seen. The fountains are working and the patina on the stonework developed over the centuries is warm and unique to Italian Renaissance gardens. It is also easy to see the design outline of the general plan that she found difficult to observe. The architectural detail of the fountains and arches is sumptuous and beautiful, but the outline of the general plan is not easy to trace, wrote Edith Wharton. Through the woods, a trail leads to the amazing Giardino Segreto, or secret garden, which is symmetrical and of such an imposing size that it's difficult to think of it as hidden or secret, for it overwhelms the eye when first encountered. It is much the same as when Edith Wharton saw it, with a large circular fountain in the ground and the fascinating water chain, or Chateau d'Eau, flowing from the two river gods above, representing the Arno and the Tiber rivers, which are filling the chain through cornucopias mounted on the shoulders. Partly surrounding this is an architectural composition of rusticated arcades between which a chateau d'eau descends the hillside from a grotto surmounted by two mighty river gods and forming the central motive of a majestic double stairway of rusticated stone work. Borden Road. As you walk up to the casino above, the mirroring gardens, guarded by the canophores, are beautiful and classic in design with pathways and sculptures telling you a story of Cinquecento, the 1500s design philosophy in Italy. At the very top of the secret gardens is, in Morton's words, crowned by Vignola's exquisite casino, surely the most beautiful garden house in Italy, also described as a summer house. Unfortunately, however, it was closed but I was able to look inside and see the fresco walls and the symmetry that abounds. The composition is simple. Around the casino with its light arcades raised on a broad flight of steps stretches a level box garden with fountains enclosed in a low wall surmounted by the famous canafore seen in every picture of Caparola. 
huge sylvan figures half emerging from their stone sheaths. Warden wrote, there was a large fountain in Parterre Gardens that are accessed through the woods on the north side. This entrance was thought to have been used when secret political meetings occurred, or perhaps for more amorous rendezvous, hence the sometimes used description as a pleasure house. The audacity of placing that row of fantastic terminal divinities against reaches of illimitable air girdled in mountains gives an indescribable touch of poetry to the upper gardens of Caparola. She wrote, concluding her visit, Wharton writes about Caparola, there is a quality of inevitableness about it. One feels of it as of certain great verse that it could not have been otherwise. Then in Vasari's happy phrase, it was born, not built. I felt that also as to realize that most of this was built close to 500 years ago and still stands in its mostly originally form and design. You think that it might endure for the same amount of time in the future. 